So what we are dealing with um, today is uh, questions of equity and inclusion, somewhat in the um, uh, within the parameters of education, of course, because the all three panelists esteem that we have with us today uh, have dealt with education for a very very long time, and I'm truly truly honored. Uh, thank you so much, um, uh, firstly, um, and with this opportunity, Madhukar, of course, for me to allow uh, to allow me to actually uh, have this panel. So thank you so much. Um, so Farida. Uh, I'll start with you actually. Um, I was doing a basic um, uh, CID background check on you <laughs> when Madhukar told me that I have to you know, uh, lead this and moderate this panel actually. And I got to know that you started, uh, you co-founded Pratham in 94. And that's my birth year, actually. Wow. So you have an experience. No, <laughs> you have an experience that's equivalent to my age, and that's huge. And um, uh, why I start with this argument is because um, when we talk about equity and inclusion as concepts, there's huge politics of equity and inclusion. Also, I mean, I realized this. I was in the last few years as an IS officer, and I feel that. बहुत सारी चीजें सिर्फ बोल दी जाती हैं कि ट्राइबल एरिया तो ऐसा रहता है और ट्राइबल मदर्स ऐसी रहती हैं और ट्राइबल स्कूल के टीचर्स तो ऐसे रहते हैं और बच्चे ऐसे रहते हैं सो आई रियली रियली वुड वांट टू नो फ्रॉम दिस ह्यूमंगस एक्सपीरियंस दैट यू हैड कि एक्चुअली हाउ डू यू अंडरस्टैंड इक्विटी इंक्लूजन या फिर इफ आई हैव टू आस्क इन अ ब्रेकिंग न्यूज वे सच क्या है बहुत ही कठिन सब मैंने क्वेश्चन है बट मेरे लिए बहुत नेचुरल था क्योंकि आई थिंक माय बैकग्राउंड इज सोशल वर्क आई हैव बीन अ पार्ट एंड पार्सल ऑफ कॉलेज ऑफ सोशल वर्क टू वेर आई वाज इन द कैपेसिटी ऑफ वाइस प्रिंसिपल इन स्कूल एंड बेसिकली व्हेन यू टॉक अबाउट इक्विटी दिस माइट साउंड लाइक अ क्लीशे दैट यू आर एक्चुअली लुकिंग एट द कॉन्स्टिट्यूशन इन योर प्री एंगल दैट यू बिलीव इन इक्विटी So mainly equity uh, was natural because when you work, and especially my passion has always been with children. I always thought every child must get education, and every child must be happy. Even before I got into uh, you know, co-founding Pratham, and sort of a chota ka udaran dete hu, maybe you understand this. Uh, we were work, we were working. We started work with uh, prostitutes, commercial sex workers in a particular area in Mumbai. And uh, that was the red light area. And uh, as a college, we had started working with them. And uh, one of our the point we were we wanting to make is that children need education, and they, and uh, no part of their the children are lying there. And uh, why shouldn't we work with children? Or आगे history और भी ज़्यादा नहीं बोलूँगी. But uh, when we started working with these mothers uh, and we had to admit them in school. Or uh, first panel was talking about communities and you know how uh, communities are important. Uh, one of the things that uh, came the teachers asked is, uh, "Aapke mark ka naam ye hai, okay? Uh, or we address this agar aap puche, and then the last sawal was, 'Aapke pita ji ka naam kya hai, okay? And I was very excited because I was going to admit 15 children as a young social worker those days in the some talk about my eighties. And uh, suddenly this was a pin drop silence because so kya puch rahe the pita ji ka naam kya? And I was looking at them and they were looking at me and I really couldn't answer. And there came a reply that uh, the mother said, um, "Koi bhi Bhagwan ka naam likho." And what was Bhagwan ka naam? There was a Ram and there was a Mahadev and there was a Shankar and and this is not an exaggeration. And um, the teacher got those children that put it. With the names of Ram, Mahadev, and I think that was my first uh, even lesson in equity. That you are talking about every child, and you are talking about opportunity to go every child, and barrier was father's name, and that was completely solved not by me or not by the teachers, but by the mother. Uh, and I think later on I started, and in Pratham we always felt that uh, every child. The reason again why I am saying this is. अभी लंबा आंसर है यू कैन स्टॉप मी वेन एवर यू वांट टू बट दैट व्हेन द चाइल्ड इज बोर्न टू मी माय सन इज बोर्न टू मी से दे आई एम आई हैपन टू बी बोर्न टू यू 
correct because he is not planned to be born to me, right? But when he is born to me, as opposed to a mate's daughter or a son, um, my son is getting all the opportunity. Okay, I can put him in school of my choice. I send him to the state, whatever I want to, do, right? And that there's a mate's daughter, or however intelligent he or she is, may not get this opportunity. So it's a question of opportunity. It is not the question of a brain. It is not the question of how intelligent you are. It is a question of what opportunity you are giving for. And I think that's another lesson I have in equity. So for me, it is very natural. I didn't think much. And therefore, when we looked at Pratham, we said every child. And when I say every child, it's a tribal, it is a disabled child, it is a child laborer. So it's matter. Yeah? Thank you. Thank you so much. I think that answers most of the questions I face on the field. Because uh, the first discouragement is that if you have to work hard, you will not get the results. So I think that solves most of the um, doubts I had. Uh, Nilish, hi. Um, I think that when I checked your blog, it was your blog. So your blog was so interesting. I think the latest blog you've written is how an Amrani worker teaches a child to clean his nose. So your blog you've written is how an Amrani worker teaches a child to clean his nose. And um, I was actually reading the entire thing and I have a problem with the word counselling actually and you mentioned how that worker actually taught um, that parent uh, about cleanliness and hygiene in general. So, I read it in my mind and I thought that Nilesh is asking a very different question because he's been working in tribal areas for a very long time. So, we are talking about what is the problem or fault I mean, what is not there. I want to really ask you in terms of equity, how are tribal areas or backward areas better than cities and better than, you know, let's say, private organizations? <laughs> yes. So that's a really a good question because, you know, normally we talk about the problems of tribal areas, but we never look at the strengths. And over these 25 years of my stay in the tribal area, I think I have learned a lot. I mean, I went there to teach, but during the process, I learned more than what probably I have taught to the students. Uh, the strength, as I can see that, you know, uh, let me just give you a quick example as Parida also gave from my old teaching days. Uh, I went to, uh, there was some topic about, you know, how the seeds disperse uh, in, the, in the nature, in the textbook, and I was teaching that to the students. Uh, next day, the student came up with, you know, sort of uh, 20 different types of seeds and started asking me, tell me, how does this disperse? And how, how does this disperse? And I was completely lost because, you know, I did not even know the name of the, those trees. And then everybody started laughing and then told me, oh, you, don't you know the, even that? <laughs> so the thing is that there is a wealth of knowledge that every community has. The question is, does our system recognize it? Right. You know, I mean, in, in a textbook, you will find two, three, four examples. But if you really look at the kind of uh, range of things that they brought in into that topic, that was completely amazing. And that was a sort of first blow on my face. And I said, wait, you have to learn a lot more than you really make any decision about the kids. Because, you know, we people coming from powerful backgrounds and powerful classes of the society tend to either with all our good intentions sympathize or you know tend to really help people but uh, yes i mean there are several such things that are in the prevalent in the tribal areas which we just don't acknowledge in the schools and that's why we find that the so-called gap between the performance is there having said that i'm also i'm also a parent of a government school because i opted to be in a village and there was no other school so my daughter visited the government school uh, so, it's really, I preferred that school to any of the private schools around in the vicinity because I, being an educator, I visited quite a few schools in the vicinity and I came to a conclusion that this is the best school possible for my daughter. Wow. For several reasons that, you know, A, at least today they are not so over competitive, whereby, you know, maybe if somebody was talking about, you know, social emotional learning and these kind of things, if you are going to teach the child that compete, compete and compete, what kind of social emotional learning we are talking about. Yeah. So they are not so overly over competitive, overtly competitive. Secondly, you know, there are 
there are uh, sort of uh, uh, children coming from all classes of the society in that same village school. So, you know, my daughter got an opportunity to really realize early in life how privileged she is. Yeah. So, you know, so the problems and the kind of casteism that you face, the kind of uh, problems related to alcohol that you face, mm. everything was in front of her. And she really learned to take, uh, deal with it in a uh, mm -hmm. much more matured manner. Yeah? So there are a lot of uh, strengths in the kids. So for example, you know, I mean, uh, if you really take any tribal child of six, six seven, eight year old, uh, the child is pretty independent. Yeah. Doesn't need the support of a mother to really, you know, feeding, eating, all that the child can handle. Right. The unfortunate part is that our system just doesn't recognize that. Ethylene kya buri hai? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and the most critical part is that is the when you are working in uh, tribal base, children bring a lot of wealth of their own language, which is going to be the critical, most critical thing in your formal education. And that goes unrecognized. I remember about a, um, five years ago, we had an, a sort of a workshop with a CER team where everybody was talking, it was about multilingualism and multilingual teaching in the classrooms. So, Matur Bhasha is a prashna, Matur Bhasha is a prashna. Yeah. So, how can any language be a problem, you know? Right. The problem is in our system that we don't accept that language. Yeah. So, you know, so the problem that we can really see is that this kind of an acceptance comes if the teachers have this notion of equity. Uh, when I started, just to end this, my answer to your question is that when I started working with the teachers uh, long ago, 20 years ago, uh, there were people who used to tell me that we bhi thoda acha ilake mein transfer kar do now, we will be also able to show you the results. You know? oh. uh, but I mean, obviously, I mean, I, I'm not blaming them. They are they under constant pressure to perform oh. with, you know, much, much uh, disadvantages or so-called disadvantages backgrounds and different kind of challenges that they face. So our yardsticks, are they really right? That's something what we have to really ask us all the time. And uh, uh, this is the idea of equity that, that I think that, you know, I mean, when, when children come, they come with a lot of strengths. Let's learn to acknowledge them. And that's what equity means to me. So I think if I can summarize what Nilesh was also trying to say, which I also realized in the yeah. is let's not be the Masihas of tribal areas. Absolutely. And uh, let's go in and uh, work according to how they want, not only take what we want. So thank you so much. So uh, I'm hello. And uh, I, uh, I probably relate most to you uh, in the panel because uh, when I read your profile, it was my Delhi University deja vu. So it was about gender and caste and so much about psychology that you've written and been involved with in Pune University. I want to see her in the... So um, my question to you, my, day. <laughs> <laughs> my question to you is that um, um, do you think um, the current policy discourse is doing justice to equity across several verticals of uh, geographic divisions, gender, religion, caste? Is it really, really doing justice to any of those parameters? Okay, now that's a very complex question. <laughs> So I'll just uh, break it up and try and you know, do justice to it. Uh, so uh, NEP is now uh, thinking of another category, uh, which is being called uh, SDEGs, so socially and otherwise uh, discriminated. Mm -hmm. But if we really look at data, it boils down to the same marginalized communities once again. So you'll end up again with the same categories who have been excluded time and again, that is the SCs, STs, DT, NT, OPC, and the rest. Uh, so I don't know how far uh, we are going to go with that. The second uh, thing that I see is when, uh, so if you look at the All India Survey of Higher Education, 2019-20, uh, which puts the gross enrollment ratio at 27.1 nationally, and the plan is that in 10 years, we are going to make it 50%. Okay. Um, I uh, have a lot of worries around this and all of them, you know, 
center stage uh, equity. Uh, as it is, the data is showing that when uh, it comes to private universities, deemed universities, etc., uh, there is no access to marginalized yeah. students. That AISHE has already recorded. Okay, because the fees are astronomical. There's hardly any support. So you're keeping them out. You know, there's a lot of gatekeeping that has already happened with privatization in the last 20 years. And now this is going to you know, have a snowball effect. So who is going to be at the losing end? Who will disappear? What absences will we see? Uh, it'll have to do with uh, poor girls. So if we talk about gender, then we have to talk about the intersections within gender. So it's not necessarily women and girls per se, but those coming from particular classes and castes and other marginalized sections, which includes men too. Uh, so if you look at last 10 years data, so those of us who are working in higher education, uh, the ST category, he will relate to this. So where are they? All those seats. Most of them are vacant and then they are converted into mm. open, open or other categories mm. across the spectrum. So I am uh, afraid that we are going to see even more complexities than we have seen in the last 20 years. And I happen to work uh, in an institution which has perfect diversity, unlike the private deemed and the rest. Where we don't have to go looking for poor people, I teach psychology, that's the main thing I do. And I studied, I'm just uh, adding a bit to what you have asked, so you'll know my location. So I studied in an elite institution in Pune, where I studied psychology and that entire syllabus and my syllabus curriculum uh, at masters. There were no poor. No, we were never talking about poor people. We were just talking about these individuals as though they are just homogenized individuals. Yeah, and I have not seen that changing because once we start naming, then we acknowledge the excluded and the inequalities. So that's not happening. So uh, the previous session was on uh, social and emotional learning. Once again, who's social and emotional learning? learning? So again, we have to acknowledge the diversity. So from when Nilesh comes, or I'm so happy to be in the same panel as you. So various uh, categories who have been you know, unacknowledged up till now, I see that access is once again going to be a problem reiterating what she's saying, that opportunity will come only with access. So geographical areas, correct. But then those geographical areas will again have your you know, denotified tribes, the scheduled tribes, the same you know, representation is going to be there. So why is it that our inclusion is not going to talk about these categories? Uh, you also mentioned in my uh, introduction and whatever you have checked out. That, uh, so the elephant in the room, and I, I know there is a follow of questions, but I want to put it out uh, right away. That who are all these excluded categories? So that is going to include the disabled, having less and less access yeah. to all kinds of higher education, not not just the one where they will you know, throw them around. So the disabled, queer community, okay, and the rest of the caste, uh, marginalized communities, the uh, religious uh, minorities. Yeah. So we we don't see. Uh, equity and you know inclusion really uh, happening. Though we've been talking about it for the last twenty years, yes, exactly. all the policies previous and the current ones. So, like, how many exceptions if we can have? I mean, if we talk about, I mean, there's so many social verticals. I mean, there's gender, there's caste, there's religion, there's geography. Yeah. If we have to talk about a policy, should we, um, in this sense, or should we leave it? I mean, standalone motivation. See, there is one meaner and one Professor Sudha who talks about queer communities, but is there anybody else or is there a policy that can control it? Uh, see, uh, while I was preparing for this and I'm you know, collecting data and once again looking at things, I realized one more thing that, uh, you know, and in the context of the work LFE does or the other panelists who spoke about TFI and the rest. See, we at one level, we are only talking about access and opportunity as in uh, getting an entry into higher education. Huh. 
But what has happened is that this marginalized community student uh, also has to become a wage earner for the family. family. Now these are two competing things. I'll give you an example of somebody uh, who Siddesh mentored in TFI and the girl took admission to my department knowing that we really uh, support the marginalized. Now she uh, managed graduation because our fees are only 10,000 rupees as against the private universities that are charging 75,000. Our master's course is 25,000 regional university as against the one and a half to two lakhs. So we are talking about affordability of fees and wage earning for a family that is below party line. So there are two competing things. Uh, I see plenty of, you know, aspirational motivation in marginalized students. I've seen that for 30 plus years. But uh, they also have to be supportive earners or like COVID or their parents had lost jobs, they were on half wage. So they also have to be wage earners. How, how are we going to carve out something unless all kinds of education is further subsidized and you know our um, earn and learn. Uh, yeah. we, we are paying these students even uh, less than you know uh, whatever more is supposed to be the yeah. basic. Or maybe more you learn, more you want. Yeah, add to what you Yeah. Just one small point. You know the question about policy. I think uh, we need to uh, actually accept that there is a equity issue, there is an access issue, and though we say access, uh, how, how many really can really afford that is higher education or even education till tenth and eleven or twelve? So one is not only access. We now we have to graduate ourselves from access opportunity to whether we call it quality and actually what is going to be employability. So whether we are looking at skills, we need to look at that. Secondly, I think so there are community. Now whether there's tribal, uh, there are SPs, uh, there are Muslim minorities. Okay. And uh, generally whether it is a Sattar committee or if a report comes through, we are talking about girls' education, we're talking about women's education. But there is a myth that girls don't go to school, you know in Muslim communities because of orthodox. Yeah. We've seen in our experience actually that it works a little different. That the parents um, uh, are much more comfortable to send the girls to school and get educated because it's like a safe. Mm -hmm. Okay? And whereas the boys are not getting enough education. Mm -hmm. So when, when you talk about the policy, we are pumping a lot of uh, you know, investment into girls' education. But what about the boys? And especially this group between 14 to 16 and 16 to 18. You know, these are children who are going to be like nowhere boys, nowhere girls. Where uh, fundamental right to education is still age of 14. We have all, all the other policies. And this particular adolescent stage is actually just now, they say, Bishari and Kete. So I think so. The other point of view, when you talk about exclusion, you talk about equity, I think it's not only disability, it's also being marginalized because there's nothing really in front of us. Understand. Really, there's this uh, small question I have to you is, um, itna intention dikta hai I mean, right now we have a room full of 50 people who at least claim to be working for uh, I mean, students and they do. Uh, they do. <laughs> they do. Okay. They do. Everybody does. Or uh, I mean, in generally, see, I mean, we meet so many people. We read so much literature that's already talked about intention. I think since we had the Atta in '74, that actually mainstream um, questions of equity and inclusion. Uh, what is going wrong that we are still hovering on the? Uh, uh, so in my opinion, you know, the devil lies in the details. At a policy level, if you take out, if you take a curriculum, say there have been studies which show that the comparative curricular studies show that the Indian curricula are not that bad. They are at almost at par with the world. Yeah. But you know, there is something called intended curriculum and something about transacted curriculum. 
and the problem actually lies in actually transacting it in, inside the class rooms. Yeah. So, so for example, you know there is this uh, researcher in US called Lisa Delpit, who is a, a I mean a black researcher um, working in education. So she has written a wonderful book called Multiplication is for White People. And uh, you know the strange name stems from an incident in her real life, uh, whereby a child came to her and tell uh, Miss Lisa, why are you teaching us multiplication? Because you know blacks normally uh, add and subtract, and that's good enough for them. So this is the kind of notion that if children can imbibe, she starts from there. So she says that absolutely that gap that you can see between the two classes or two communities is a created one. Yeah. And unless we really, you know, I mean, expect more from our children, how are we really going to really, you know, uh, uh, really give them that equal opportunity? So we are talking about access, opening schools, coming into the, you know, into the mainstream. But if the experience, I will just tell you one quick example that one of my friends in tribal belt sent his first child into the school and you know he went up to almost up to graduation and the second child he asked to drop out after 10th so i asked him that you know i mean what's the matter you know you allowed your first child to go ahead and why are you holding your second child back so he told me that you know i mean kuch kaam nahi karta saath mein isse acha hai ki bhai mere saath rahe basically sikhata hu aapko Mm. So, if this is the kind of image of education that we are creating in front of, you know, first generation school group goers, uh, how, how, how do we really see it in the light of equity? And, uh, you know, generally what happens is that, that in the want of doing everything at a very big scale, we go on diluting the levels. Why? Because it is not possible to do it at a scale. Yeah? So when we implement certain policies, if we really, you know, are not patient enough, if we are not having a long-term view and then plan, you know, plan properly, the thing policies are never going to translate into, into reality. And you know, we are talking about social change. So it happens over years. It cannot happen in a in an accelerated mode. The things that have gone wrong for centuries together cannot be corrected in you know one year, two year kind of a time span. And secondly, you know, in a country like India, resources will be always scarce. So we have to be even more careful while planning the things and have a stage-wise approach and then you know sort of see to it that whatever we are investing into it are bringing out the results in the right direction. So in my opinion, that you know the 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 question that goes wrong is that our our targets that we really set for ourselves and uh, you know so so for a simple example if i lower down my expectation and expect 100 percent children to really reach say about 80 percent and if i keep my expectations at you know at a higher level and expect children to reach about 50 percent of that what is better what is happening, I mean, this is the, I have seen that happening over the last 25 years is that day by day we are expecting lesser and lesser from children from the marginalized communities because we are not able to achieve the targets, right? And then what happens is that, you know, these numbers, uh, 100%, 50% or mm, 95% make us feel good, you know, that kaagas pe achha lagta hai, but the numbers by themselves are not going to tell us anything. Yeah. See, I mean, we live in the era of measurements, and I don't say that measurements are not required, but what are we measuring? 50% of what and 95% of what? These are the things which are very critical and we have to understand them first qualitatively. Even take an example of now the FLN mission, yeah? The policy has proposed a drastic perspective change in what we understand by reading writing. It is talking about Reading writing just doesn't mean knowing the script and decoding it one after another, but it talks about five very critical skills, five, five, different, five areas and the five roles that you have to play with the text, and that is the expectation written at the policy level. See the GR that is issued. It will tell you the same thing again, which I had heard 20 years ago. Now, I mean, we don't even feel that there is a discrepancy between what our policy framework is telling us and what we are doing on the ground. 
and unless this technical discussions happen unless these discourses really are made public and people debate about it we are not going to really achieve our goals if you take the example of literacy there was a period in american history which is called reading wars so literally the senators like educators used to come with research papers and talk about it that look this is what our data shows and then the there were conservatives who were going in certain way and the progressives going in another way so if we are averse from this kind of rigor i don't believe that you know we will be ever able to uh, achieve the kind of equity that we are talk talking about because the problems are complex let's first acknowledge them and try to really you know face them as they are without that if we try to oversimplify something just because we are measured to able such certain things in a very objective mm -hmm. manner yeah. doesn't mean that is a good indicator for your problem so the data and numbers by themselves don't tell us anything we have to deep dive into the processes of it a lot of talk is out right now happening about the outcomes and indicators and benchmarks and these kind of things how benchmark can be reason i can just you know make the child mug up the test and increase my benchmark so it's not enough that i just reach that level of the test what process has happened before in the classroom that would matter and that would really create the strength in the child otherwise it's like you know again learning for the test kind of an exercise so things are complex let's acknowledge them and let's really try to take support from whatever has happened before that is also another thing that i can observe in our system there's hardly any kind of institutional memory a lot of good work that happened in scrt today is nowhere visible yeah so every time with every policy if we are going to come with something new as a program there is a huge confusion among the teachers there is a huge confusion among the system आणि मग आता आलाय काय तरी एक अजून एक नवीन प्रोग्राम आला आहे असे येतच राहतात त्याच्यामधनं सो पीपल अँड आय सेट एट द बॉटम ऑफ द पिरामिड सो आय नो दॅट हाऊ टीचर्स रिएक्ट हा आता आहे काइंड ऑफ अँड दे आर नॉट रॉंग बिकॉज यु नो इफ यू एक्सपेक्ट द थिंग टू हॅपन ओव्हर नाईट एकदम ती हळद वगैरे असणार असेल तर नाही लोक लक्ष देणार तुमच्याकडे हे आपल्याला लक्षात घेतलं पाहिजे सो देर हॅज टू बी अ लॉंग टर्म प्लॅन देर हॅज टू बी अ डिबेट ऑन दॅट देर आय if you just take an example of literacy we haven't even invented a single method that cannot teach any child and we haven't invented a single method that can teach every child so it has to be a balanced literacy kind of an approach which the policy document is today talking but there can be a method that can teach every child there, there, there is a there is a sort of that's what they call there is a balance of balance things of. that one has to really talk about and we started submitting our plans we started submitting our budgets nobody is right now discussing ki bhaiya wo policy mein likha kya hai open up your nikum bharat guideline ka chapter 2 read it at least 80% of those words haven't ever appeared in our pre service training they haven't appeared in our in service training how the poor teachers are supposed to really understand them yeah so this entire s of you know doing everything at at an accelerated pace yeah. is something what uh, the results are guaranteed there like i mean they are designed to fail so the reason we've been failing for 75 years now is because of lack of sincerity and you know the devil of details that as a community we have not dealt with It's i won't say about the sincerity because that is like doubting somebody's no. intention <laughs> but you know the rigor yes the rigor. i mean yeah. we haven't given enough time for our people to understand things unpack things go into into the details even before they understand anything you are giving them a target mm -hmm. yeah do this in two years do this in one year and then what happens the target is achieved mm -hmm. see the i mean you can tell me that much better because if the systems gives you a target it is achieved yeah 10% 10% not 9.8 not 10.2 you can get it achieved you, you can get it achieved <laughs> so that's something what we have yeah. to yeah. Uh, I wanted to bring in a couple of other dimensions. Just responding to what he has been saying about uh, reinventing the wheel, uh, wasn't the Kothari Commission, 1964-66, and the Radha Krishnan Commission? Yeah. No, they gave a blueprint. which i feel to a certain But extent excellent. is still valid it's still valid all sectors of so education yeah. and we haven't even gotten there and now we have a <laughs> new agenda okay uh, 
the other thing that I wanted to quickly bring in when you asked about policy, and of course I'm talking about higher education, is that policies have been in place. You know, so the University Grants Commission to ensure the equity and inclusion has some mechanisms. Now, whether they function, how well do they function, even the surveys that have been undertaken uh, have had just 50% respondents. And so what are these mechanisms that every higher education institution, that is a college, university, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, whatever the type, will have uh, an anti-sexual harassment, prevention of sexual harassment uh, committee in place. It will have an anti-ragging committee in place. It will have a grievances committee. And a newer addition in the last seven, eight years is it will have an equal opportunity equal for opinion. SC, ST, and minorities. Hmm? So these five, six things need to be functional, but uh, in practice and in implementation, uh, there is no punitive action for non-compliance. The surveys have barely 50% respondents. So we really don't know what is the national picture in terms of their yeah. functionality. And we have two limelight, I, I don't like to call them cases, two limelight individuals. They are enough to, you know, I'm just flagging off this issue. So all of us sitting in this room have heard about Rohit Vermula. Yeah. And we've all heard now of Dr. Payal Tarun. Yeah. Right? And there's plenty of material that has come out. I have three, four references here, which is talking about casteism and inequalities which get reinforced. So one thing is about access that is getting in. And the second is how do we survive in these systems, which are so discriminatory. Yeah. Uh, so the individuals, all the stakeholders within the system are pretty discriminatory. That is many of us as privileged persons, whether it comes to the administration, the professors themselves, because it's a skewed ratio. So marginalized professors are way less than they should be on all campuses. That we have enough data. And then you have within the students themselves. So way back in 2010, uh, late Dr. Sharmila Regi, I think we should all look at it because it applies to all sectors of education. She wrote a paper called Education as Smriti Ratna, as mm. Mark Kampule called it. Yeah. And then what should be the practices on the ground when after, you know, Mandal Commission and the rest, 50 to 51 percent reservation, affirmative action has come into existence as law, as policy. But then it gets, you know, translated into everyday practices in higher education. You don't see discrimination going away. Just to give you an example, in the Payal Tarvi case, people were talking about counseling for Payal Tarvi. Yeah. You know, this first uh, tribal Muslim doctor from her village. Now, who needed, like you, I too, I may be a mental health practitioner, but I don't like the way counseling is used. Counseling is used in terms of, you know, advice giving or telling somebody to shut up. So they were saying that Payal Tarvi required counseling. Uh, when it is very evident that the privileged students who were supposed to coexist with her, he they were the ones right from induction yeah. who needed to make space, you know, to make themselves accommodating of all the others who have already come into higher education for the last 20 years. And uh, since I work in a diversity college, I, I can see it every day. If I was in an elite institution, I would also be very far away from social realities. But since I'm not, day in and day out, I, I see that happening. And that is where we need lots of work on the ground within institutions and policies that are enabling, you know, actionable. They have to be actionable and all the stakeholders have to become accountable. So how do we make so many people you know, accountable. That that is the key question, and it's the same across, uh, you know, yeah. whether it's school education yeah. or higher secondary or anything for that matter. So I thought we should bring in this crucial sure question. I mean, on that one, I had a question. Yeah. So I just wanted to add two things. One is that none of us get angry. You know, uh, it 
take. We, we, we kind of take for granted that these children from these communities will not learn. Okay? So, Shagro, uh, Pacharo, uh, it's okay if these children don't learn. Then you have this accelerated learning, they are learning by doing. So, I think there's a time come when I'm, I'm not. I'm not telling all of you to get angry, but I think some amount of anger should be there. So that we can do something about it. So you know, we've just taken an attitude ki ye aisa hi hone wala hai. And that as long as we continue like that, nothing will happen. Secondly is the point that uh, uh, you know, Grace, you were making about, uh, you know, uh, expectations. It's true. Hmm? But it's also true that we have to start somewhere. So when we say that some children don't know at all, though they have an access and their quality is, is at stake, we need to look at those children a little separately and see how we could really bring them to a particular level. And I think there is a difference between saying lowering expectations and there's a difference by saying that can you bring them, it's like a head start program, a, that you give a group of children an head start. So they can then compete with others. And this can be done at every level. Even children, you know, higher education program, you know, what is here, uh, boys and girls who don't know English. And when they go into college, so many of us have faced that. Yeah. And you can imagine what they feel. And if colleges do not support them, because they only, uh, you know, lag behind because they don't have this great language English. Mm. You can imagine what happens to them. So there are plenty of examples we can go on, yeah? So I, one thing is getting angry. Second is I think we all, instead of telling that this one should do that, that one should do that, and we need to say that even this Nipun Bharat or NEP, I don't know how many of us have really read it, how many of us have really analyzed it, how many of us, are, you know, we are going into trainings and trainings and trainings, but have we really gone into nuances of that? We have not. So we should really accept and say, let's take responsibility, let's take some time and let's explain to ourselves what we mean. And I think we need to start saying a little no to some things. So we are also accepting all the policies, we are not looking at the discrimination in these policies. So these nuances you have, I think we need to, we need to look at them and we need to accept it. But some of us start accepting it, I think others will also um, follow. I'm not saying that it's a bad idea to have special programs for marginalized, for the tribals, for girls in the institutions, arts and schools. All sorts of problems hai in terms of education. So we need to have a goal and say that no child is left behind. Okay, the SDG is saying that. But for a child not to be left behind, what are some of the things that we need to do? And therefore, I think as COVID, uh, you know, Mr. Kumar has gone, he was trying to say COVID is good or bad. But I'm trying to say that it's important we have learned and it's a learning that there has been a learning loss, definitely, whether we like it or not. So let's accept that children have not learned. But let's also accept that certain children have learned, not because of school, but because of their parents. Because so there's some connection during the two years with some adult or somebody in the school as their parents. And I think we should optimize this, that our communities, our panchayats are so strong. If we start working with them, we don't need people like us. In, in terms of external, uh, you know, advocates. Because they themselves know what to do. Yeah. So this, yeah. as far as this learning loss thing is concerned, we should be really careful uh, negating it. Yeah. Okay. You know, there has been, I mean, uh, I mean uh, sir is not here right now, but we have a cohort of people, children, who were tested in February 2020, and then again after 8 months yeah. of lockdown, and then again 11 months of lockdown, same, around uh, 1300 children. And there is a clear-cut learning loss that one can see. Not that children have forgotten everything, but there is a loss in particular areas. Yeah. So unless we really find it out well and then really you know mitigate them as as per the need, it's not going to really help us in that that sense. So this learning loss mitigation cannot happen at a state level. State cannot produce a one particular book and ask everyone to really reteach everybody, which is sheerly waste of resources. Right. It has to be a local phenomena where to empower our teachers really to analyze. So the assessment discussion did not really bring out bring out the purpose of assessment, which should be diagnostic basically in nature. Let the first teacher know 
Right. And how to really use it and you will practice it in the class because ultimate change will happen only at that level. We all sitting outside will be you know, sort of getting some some broad level picture. Yeah. The teacher is mostly dependent. Yeah. So, if you ask him, he will give you a question. If he doesn't ask him, there will be no interest. I have some uh, interesting questions. I probably would clap some of them. Uh, one question asked me that there was John Korean's research suggested Muslim children often fare worse than um, the SDSD in education outcomes. Yeah. So, what can be done to recognize and act on this? Uh, mostly at the systematic level, preferably because I think individual actions are not really helped. Yeah. If you ask me, systematic level, I think any of you can answer. I think uh, John Korean's uh, study is showing that children who are in the higher classes, mm. okay, so once they cross seventh standard, eight, nine, ten, may takleef hai, and if you compare it to other children, they don't do well. Uh, I think the answer is very simple. It's ba basically the socioeconomic condition that people are living. Their own parents' literacy levels, and you also see that wherever the literacy levels of the parents is high, children do learn. We found it in all our experiences, whether it's in Bihar, Lucknow, uh, you know, uh, UP, or even in Mumbai, that where education levels of parents is good for 10th standard, children are learning. The other one which, you know, the question that you are asking is that systemically we have to acknowledge that. And uh, at the government level, I think at some point of acknowledgement is done. It, but as Nilay was saying, that once again you are having one, like a magic wand for all children. Right. And Muslims also in their own socioeconomic, um, you know, background are very different in different uh, parts of the country, whether you take the Western Maharashtra, quite different than what you go into Bihar. So we can't, or in Kerala, okay, things are quite different. Also so sex, no? Yeah. Yeah, sex different sex are there, so we don't have time just now, but so one has to look, I mean, the principle is the same. Then going we to deep dive, look at going to nuances, going to data. Yeah. 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 I was saying, and then we look at Dubai probably. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Dubai and Singapore, yeah. Um, and another question was, um, if you could categorize the stakeholders with respect to equity and inclusion, who would, they, who would they be and what would you say is the one thing they should do to bring in the said equity and inclusion? So like stakeholders would be NGOs and uh, within the system or it can be the parent, I mean multiple. So I mean all those who are stakeholders in the process of education have to be part of the you know, the, the, the uh, stakeholder to be in the process of equity. The strongest being those who discriminate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, from where does the discrimination come? And uh, I mean, nowadays I can see a lot of tendency to push everything under the carpet. Hai nahi aise. Wo to hota tha kabhi piche. You know, wo, there, there is no caste discrimination because it used to happen sometime. Right. In India, it was bad, but now it's not there. So if that is the kind of approach that we are going to follow, people don't won't discuss it at all inside the classrooms. And I think that, you know, I mean, the, the first step towards sensitizing people towards is that really start discussing it. Right. So for, for, for a person like me, I genuinely believe that the caste problem was, it doesn't exist anymore because we were under the illusion. It used to happen when Ambedkar was there. Right. When I first entered into the tribal beds, when my daughter started going to the local school, it hit me. Until then, I was genuinely under the impression it's all historical, we don't want, need to really look into it now. So, this is, I think, those who are in the powerful classes of the society are the biggest stakeholder for equity, and we have to work with them. Right. I think my we are acknowledging also in young people, youth. Uh, those who are going into colleges and young, uh, you know, school children, but especially youth, uh, they, they are seeing it from a different lens today. So they are not talking so much about discrimination. And I think this, today is a point where you need to sensitize them about what's happening in the country. We have stopped having any study circles or any kind of political discourses in our college. We have no time. Our is just to talk a lot. But at least, if you don't have it that way, at least structure it. And moral science, civic sense, Muslim is subject, Dalo, and environment, let's talk about that to the youth. I think that's the hope also we have. 
14 year, uh, I have a positive answer for a change because I really be disrupting things up, you know. And I agree, and I'm glad that somebody else, whenever I'm in panels, uh, generally I end up speaking like this. So I'm very glad to hear Nilesh uh, initially responding to it in this way. That I think the primary onus uh, rests, uh, apart from all stakeholders in education, on privileged people. No, uh, all of us unlearning our privilege, uh, our entitlement, uh, as we worked in the education sector, questioning it, yeah. no, stepping back and reflecting on all the social and cultural capital that we carry, English for instance, uh, and where has it come from? Many of us are fourth, fifth generation learners, and uh, since Ambedkar's time, even now the Dalit Bhajans and the others are barely second, third generation learners. Mm -hmm. So are the poor Muslims and the rest. It's something that we really, really need to acknowledge. Uh, to answer Farida ji, uh, something that we have been doing uh, for the last 30 years in my institution, uh, we run a group. Initially, uh, uh, I had called it Disha Psychology Study Circle because uh, I wanted it to sound non-threatening. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that was okay. But after about seven, eight years, uh, we settled on uh, Disha Peer Support and Speak Out Group. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Where a lot of peer learning, and I'm very happy to say that before COVID, other uh, Disha people were talking about CAA, NRC, and everything, you know, all, all those concerns. So uh, Disha has created a safe space for all these diversities of students. And I have written a lot, students have written a lot, you can access it on Google Scholar. Uh, what are our learnings? That a lot of our privileged students have learned a lot from the others. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, what he was talking about. Uh, I mean, you don't have to tell people who are staying, you know, 10 people in a room in the bustis of Pune how to be accommodated, <laughs> yeah. how to emotionally and otherwise, you know, optimize things. Uh, they are they only able to tell us 10 by 10. if only we are willing to listen. So that is something we have succeeded in doing in Disha, and I'm really, really, you know, happy and proud about it because in my own circles uh, when so much of you know muslim and dalit bashing is happening i'm off i don't know how many whatsapp groups in the last three four years but these youngsters you know, bring this and uh, that includes the privileged the upper caste and the rest also they are willing to listen so if we create these congenial spaces where uh, those who haven't spoke out, spoken out are able to give voice and the rest are willing to step back, reflect. Uh, I think in the last three, four years that everything was going for a toss. Uh, Disha went online and everything doesn't work online. No? So <laughs> with due respect and you're back to be offline again, no? you're once again yeah. online. And these spaces make a lot of difference because then what we were talking about, not just attitudinal change or not just, you know, being politically correct, but some amount of behavioral change yeah. does happen. And I'm pretty I think there's a lot of subconscious creeping, at least in youth, because I remember my gender exposure was through these tutorials of their universities, yeah. you know, yeah. giving readings, discussing in it and all of that. But, um, and I have a last question from somebody, and I think you three are absolutely fit to answer this actually. Uh, do NGOs and social sector organizations also fall foul of not being equitable and inclusive themselves with the people they have? So who calls us out? I have a question. Very interesting if somebody is for this podcast. Go. Yes, they do. <laughs> so who calls them out? <laughs> See, it's all of us to really re yeah, reflect because you know those all those who come from powerful backgrounds, all those who come with different strong cultural and social capital, it is up to them to really reflect. And NGOs are founded by these people, you know, not by the tribe but from the village. So you know they are absolutely not free from these uh, ills. 
uh, and that sensitization has to be there. I mean, they might be good intended people. Yeah. Not that they want to do anything bad per se in the society, but the approach and this entire approach of equity and acceptance might not be there just because you are doing social work. Right. Since I'm one of the founders, I was saying <laughs> <laughs> that I went to a municipal school when I was a child. So that's where my passion for education came, right? Um, having said that, um, I don't think we should, we should generalize that all NGOs uh, are uh, discriminative in nature. There are different factors to it, and we will not get into it. But I think what the NGOs or civil society organizations, as in we at be doing is if you honestly need to talk to everybody about your own values and about your own culture and what did you start with and if you're looking at for example you're looking at every child then you know that one to dekho ki such much every child is sara bab dekhte ho kya and then you need to say every child you also need those resources you need that those those capacities so then it's all about your mindset right so you may not be able to do everything but you are at least able to support others for doing something on on that front so i think it's high time that we all look into what we are supposed to be doing and how do we really give you know not only access opportunity but make it a little more inclusive and equity you know for uh, every child and every human being on, in, on this uh, domain i so i don't think anyone of us need to be privileged for the child thank you So to answer your question, just some months ago, I had given my students, master's students, an exercise to take a look at the websites of uh, several NGOs and analyze the category component, because our team or whatever it is about us. So our names give us away. Okay, yeah. and uh, I agree with her that we cannot generalize, but definitely uh, there needs to be a change, not just in terms of tokenism, but a correct kind of representation, so that uh, you know we don't end up representing those who need to represent themselves, and that applies to all sectors, the government sector that I work with also. So uh, you know. There is a need for a reality check, and then you know this equity, inclusion, and real kind of social transformation is going to happen when we allow various people who have been underrepresented for a long, long time the space to come on that you know, equal line and be in the same space. You know? Thank you so much, uh, all three of you, and because given that I was also panelist and time turn moderator, I just add a. Very very small anecdote to this to wrap up this discussion. Uh, why I started with the politics of uh, um, equity and inclusion was because when I went to Nandurwar, uh, there were a lot of things that were told to me. And given that I have been a proper Tamil, Delhi, Bombay, uh, there are those. So um, when I went, I put my phone number outside my office, and a lot of people, uh, my employees came up to me and said, "Ki, um, madam, बहुत लोग call करेंगे आपको और ये परेशान कर देंगे और इनका कोई conflict नहीं रहता बना देते हैं और ये आपको बोलेंगे until date I don't even get two calls per day it's just a threat uh, to my employees yeah. because if my number is public uh, they will at least explicitly um, not disturb people so that's why I started and I think uh, it was a wonderful panel discussion and thank you so much to all three of you thank you, thank you. Thank you so much.